Good evening and namaste. I am Aditi, welcoming you all for this 14th episode of Nature Speaks, brought to you by Himalayan Nature. We have with us Dr. Toti Sudeti, Director of Himalayan Nature for Technical Support. And because it is International Vulture Awareness Day today, we are here to talk on the conservation of vultures. It is a pleasure to have Dr. Ralph Burish, one of the leading raptor biologists in the world, Dr. Ralph is the Africa and Asia Program Director at Peregrine Fund and also a senior researcher at Wageningen University. He was involved with several ecological research and conservation projects in Southern and West Central Africa and has held his position as a project coordinator for the Forest Elephants Project on the Smithsonian Institute in Gabon. Dr. Ralph has also conducted several research and conservation projects in Europe, such as raptor movement ecology and conservation, impact of global conservation treaties on bird population trends in Europe and Africa, and flyway management plans. He has had several publications on different conservation issues of various species, like the impact of trophy hunting on lions and other large carnivores in northern Cameroon, impacts of habitat alteration on nocturnal mammals in African rainforests, forest elephant seasonal distribution in Gabon, and consequences for conservation of Sumatran orangutan. So Ralph, welcome to the Nature Speaks program. Thank you very much, Aditi, and, and thank you, Telsi. Thanks very much for the invitation, and thanks everyone for attending on this International Vulture Awareness Day. Um, so let me share my screen then, so we can go to the presentation. Uh, uh, or do you want to say a few more things, Aditi? I guess so. Uh, yeah. Just uh, yes. before I hand it over to you, I'd like to make a quick announcement. Mm -hmm. For everyone's information, the session is being recorded and we are also streaming live in Himalayan Nature's Facebook page. If you would like to ask any questions regarding the presentation, please use the chat option, which will be open just before the presentation ends. And over to you, Ralph. Thank you. Oops. Yes. So again, thank you very much for this invitation. And uh, I'll be speaking to you, to you today about vultures in East Africa, particularly. And so this talk is about saving critically endangered vultures in East Africa's Mara landscape, in particular in southern Kenya. Um, and I work at the Peregrine Fund which is a um, United States-based organization, uh, and its mission is to conserve birds of prey worldwide. Uh, our vision is that raptor populations and their ecosystems thrive, that human communities are enriched by our work, and that raptors are valued by people. Um, we have global experts on birds of prey and their conservation, and our strategy is basically to prevent raptor extinctions. And among those are those critically endangered vultures, which are really core birds for our program, especially in Africa, but also elsewhere, such as in Asia, of course. Um, we protect areas or try to protect areas that have a high raptor conservation value. And our focus is really global. And it's to address threats uh, to birds of prey worldwide. Um, so the Peregrine Fund is involved in the protection and research of many species worldwide. Many of these are, are African birds of prey uh, from the very large white-headed vulture, this one, which is up to four, four and a half to five kilograms, to very tiny Sokoki scopsal of a few, uh, of, of 60 grams, 70 grams, and, and pygmy falcon. Uh, I'll be focusing this talk on vultures. Um, but my work at Wageningen also involves tagging marsh areas, for example, which, which we've done um, and they're online. Uh, they travel to Africa, of course. There's uh, six birds that are already in, in Spain now that we've tagged this year. And uh, this is just an example of the website that we have. These marsh areas do get killed on, on the way to Africa. Uh, on migration, they get shot and we've had one bird poisoned. Uh, sadly. So 
yeah, some of the same threats that we see in vultures uh, also occur and threaten in the marsh area populations. Uh, my work in the Netherlands also involves GPS tracking of goshawk on the left and white-tailed eagle, the bird on the right, where we've tagged GPS tagged juveniles this year and last year. Um, I've worked in Cameroon myself on various species of raptors, including dark chanting goshawk, the bird on the upper left, and grasshopper buzzard, which is a, an intra african migrant in West Africa. Uh, and that's the bird on the, the chicks there below and, and on the right. Anyway, this talk is about vultures. And in West Africa, there's a lot of trade in vultures. These are traded hooded vultures in Nigeria. And they're traded for belief-based use, is what we call it. Um, uh, people actually use the skins of these vultures. Entire vultures may also be consumed, just consumed, not these old uh, carcasses, but fresher carcasses. But people will use hooded vulture head, for example, because there's a belief that it will bring good fortune to people if before construction of a house, for example, they bury these, these uh, heads in the garden where the construction is planned. It's a big trade. In Nigeria, species are being traded that are no longer seen in the country, such as leopard-faced and white-headed vulture. Those species have have basically vanished from Nigeria, but they're still traded on the markets which in Nigeria, which, which seems to suggest that there's, there's a, uh, a trafficking going on from neighboring countries and maybe further, further east in, in Africa uh, to, to the Sudans and maybe even from East Africa. Um, the global conservation status of diurnal African raptors is depicted here, where you see the, the, the years on the x-axis and the numbers of species that are either uh, near threatened, vulnerable, endangered, or critically endangered. And there's a slow but steady increase, and rather rapid actually, these past years, of uplisting of, of raptors on this ICN rest list, where more species are becoming endangered or even critically endangered. And this is a trend, obviously, which we're also seeing elsewhere, but in particular, the, the African uh, vultures are being threatened, and I'll get to that in a bit. Uh, this is uh, an article that was um, coordinated by Chris McClure, also of the Peregrine Fund, in 2018. It shows on the upper panel here the richness, the numbers of species um, of all raptors in the world. The redder, the greater than the numbers of species per country. And you see some of the, the African countries have high numbers, same in, in, uh, in South America, of course, and in Asia. But if we look at the numbers of threatened raptors, which is this panel here on the, on the bottom, you see that there's quite a few, or quite highest numbers of, of threatened raptors that occur in, in East Africa. So what has happened with the vultures? Well, they've declined, and the declines have gone fast. Uh, there's an annual rate of decline uh, which is shown here at the bottom of this figure. This is my co colleague Darcy Ogada, who coordinated this paper, which appeared in 2016, and was basically the basis for the uplisting um, of all those vultures to, to critically endangered or endangered levels. Um, what is shown here is the projected change over three generations, which is slightly more than 50 years in vultures, that it um, has been recorded. Uh, based on road surveys and other surveys of vultures throughout Africa. In different regions, which are here in the bottom, the south, the north of, of Africa, the east, west, etc. And based on various studies, which are here at the bottom, these numbers here. And it shows mean uh, rates of decline, which are quite fast. Not as fast as in um, the Indian subcontinent, really, uh, for the Asian vultures, but still fast and enough to uplist those species to critically endangered or endangered. This 80% decline over three generation is basically um, the limit there where birds are, are seriously critically endangered. So you see uh, most of these species such as Egyptian vulture, hooded whiteback, rupels vulture, cape vulture, and white-headed vulture, they, um, yeah, were, endangered or critically endangered based on these counts and those declines. So that's hooded vulture. It's a smaller vulture. It's, it's widespread in, in West Africa. It's mostly associated with people. Um, 
and it's a species which which is still very common uh, fairly common it's one of the more common raptors in west africa but it's declining fast uh, rupel's vulture this is an adult one from cameroon also critically endangered now whiteback vulture also critically endangered um, Egyptian vulture, which obviously also has breeding populations in Eurasia uh, and which migrates to Africa. The African breeding populations have seriously declined. It's endangered now. White-headed vulture is the rarest of the vultures. Probably no more than five and a half thousand individuals left throughout Africa. It's, it's um, ecologically a very different vulture. It, it ranges over small ranges and it catches live prey. And it's become very rare and it's mostly confined to parks throughout Africa. leopard face vulture now endangered, also occurs a little bit outside of Africa, but has also fast declined. So the question is, what is killing Africa's vultures? Well, it's mostly poisoning. And uh, there's been a review of causes of mortality of almost 8,000 vultures in 26 countries throughout Africa. And these have indicated the, the following reasons for their decline. Poisoning really is the main threat that is killing um, vultures throughout the continent and it occurs for a number of reasons the main reason in East Africa especially is retaliatory poisoning so people poison uh, lions and hyenas when they lo lose livestock and then leave uh, carcasses laced with pesticides such as Cabo Furan out um, and the vultures come in and they die basically as bycatch they're not the intended victims but many more die than usually hinds or, or hyenas at such carcasses and then there's increasingly since 2010 there's intentional poisoning by ivory poachers and that's happening especially in southern africa but it's spreading and not just um, poisoned elephants but also poisoned buffalo and rhino um, people target vultures because of their sentinel role. Vultures would linger over carcasses even after elephants have just been shot. They're very efficient scavengers, so they will find an elephant carcass fast. So obviously poachers want to remain undetected. So they, they intentionally poison vultures to, to, to try to get rid of that sentinel fu function. Basically that flag in the landscape, that, that circling vultures indicate their presence. Um, and then there's other reasons why people poison or kill vultures. It's for belief-based use, as I just mentioned. In West Africa, that's, that's quite important based on this data set of killed vultures. Of those carcasses, 29% of them were killed for um, traditional superstitious use of body parts. It also often uh, involves the use of poison. And then there's other reasons uh, why vultures die, such as ele electrocution and increasingly also uh, collisions with wind power lines. Uh, with uh, wind turbines. So quite a number of threats and quite different than these, this scala of threats when you compare it to what is causing the vulture decline in Asia, which was uh, Diclofenac, obviously. This is uh, one image, one example of, of a case where a lion was poisoned in uh, Ruaha uh, National Park in Tanzania. This was retaliatory poisoning, people lost cows and killed the lion, but also killed 40 odd white-backed vultures, uh, tawny eagle, a bateleur, and a hooded vulture. And what was typical was for the hooded uh, vulture and the, and the tawny eagle, their heads were removed. So it indicates that even though this was retaliatory poisoning, that people removed the heads for the trade, probably because it's worth a lot. Uh, in Nigeria, people would pay up to $100 now for a vulture carcass and eagle heads and feet are also traded for a lot of money. There's trade in Tanzania as well, though we, do, we don't know at which scale and, and how often it occurs, but we're trying to look into that. These are some of the stats for Southern Guinea, where our team has uh, witnessed many boma attacks this year due to COVID and reduced mobility. The um, numbers of attacks that were reg registered were fewer. Um, we saw 31. Uh, during the same period in 2019, this year only 20. Uh, there have been three poisoning responses, respo responses to two poisoning events happening, uh, 13 in 2019. And we have conflict mitigation meetings, uh, which seven occurred. You see some of the examples of what is being killed and why people would poison carnivores, such as that hyena on the right. And uh, when they do, of course, vultures get killed. Imagine a large elephant carcass such as this one that might attract vultures especially if it's there and it's been poisoned and it's lying there for for one week or longer 
many vultures given the area that they that they range over vast areas um and multiple countries even and and they would cover in three weeks 200,000 square kilometers we see that with gps track vultures so they're attracted to an elephant carcass from a wide area so one poison carcass might kill a lot of birds and that has happened um the illegal poisoning of 155 elephants, elephants for ivory in, in only a period of three years, in 2012 to 14, caused the death of, uh, death of more than 2,000 vultures. And also a lion and five spotted hyena, two African wild dogs, and two battleurs, also a scavenger, um, a, a scavenging eagle in, in Africa. Um, so, yeah, those are large numbers. Um, this is a case in, in Botswana that, that occurred last year and it killed many vultures. Um, 486 white-backed vultures were killed here, uh, 28 hooded vultures were killed, 17 white-headed vultures, 14 leopard-faced and 10 cape vultures. Uh, that's, that was just one case, so well over 500 vultures killed in a single incident in that case but there are many more incidents that we find now or there are incidents that that are not discovered obviously many remain undiscovered um, so what we're recording is an underestimate basically of what is actually happening and then there's this trade that people sell the parts such as these heads of vultures in in south africa being sold in natal where the trade is also happening um, and many vultures for that purpose are being traded, the same as in Nigeria and been in West Africa. Alongside pangolins and other animals at such fetish markets or, or voodoo markets. Um, there are a lot of reasons why people use these parts. Um, I told you about the example for hooded vulture previously for large vultures in, in West Africa. Um, there's a lot of reasons why people would, would use that. Um, they believe it, it, it cures epilepsy or it, uh, it removes evil spirits and, and that sort. So this is a photo taken by Stephen Awoyemi. He's a student, a PhD student working in, in Nigeria and he took it a month ago. It's rupels and a white bag vulture, the, their heads being sold on markets. This, this happens openly in, uh, in Nigeria. And as I said, these species are now very rare in that country, but they're still sold on the markets there. This, and this, this is quite typical now. What is happening is that some vultures have become so rare, it's difficult to find them. So this one um, is a yellow-billed kite, actually, but its head has been plucked so that it resembles a hooded vulture. And that brings in more cash. Uh, people ask more money for a vulture. So this one sold as a hooded vulture will will earn much more, uh, will earn a trader much more than than when it's a kite. So people pluck the the heads. And yeah, sadly this happened from September last year, um, but especially from February this year, over two thousand of these hooded vultures were poisoned in in one poisoning event is what we call it. It was, was incidences across a large area in Guinea-Bissau, which has high densities of, of hooded vultures still. Um, but it's probably the largest mass mortality event that was recorded or has been recorded for, for vultures. Um, over 2,000 of, of these hooded vultures then were, were found. And they were poisoned, um, and that, that has uh, uh, been confirmed now for the trade. So this is a photo I took when I still lived in, in Cameroon. You would see these hooded vultures moving around marketplaces and, and picking up scraps alongside feral dogs. And, and um, maybe one uh, important ecosystem service, a service that vultures deliver for people. They, they rid towns of scraps of meat that would otherwise be, be rotting and lying around. Um, this is a typical image for, for any West African town. You would see hooded vultures amongst these markets and at slaughterhouses. Apart from the, the poisoning, there's, there's electrocution, which, which is quite uh, a phenomenon and it's uh, increasing um, and it's probably killing many more raptors, including vultures, than we know. Uh, this map shows um, where the most lethal power lines are in, this is Kenya and that's Tanzania, um, in East Africa. So it shows where the threats are highest, but, but it's a threat that's increasing um, in scale. And in many areas where we look, 
and where we have power lines that are badly built, where the lines go over the top um, and um, short circuiting raptors landing on them um, get electrocuted basically because their wings touch two lines at the same time. And uh, uh, we're seeing uh, these badly constructed for raptors power lines go up in many areas across East Africa. So it's an increasing and and not uh, well understood in terms of the numbers of raptors that die problem. But we are hoping to try and look into this and, and try to mitigate this um, by retrofitting these one can prevent a lot of raptor deaths, especially in areas where continuously uh, birds get electrocuted. There's one example at the port of Sudan where Egyptian vultures have been killed for many decades actually. Those were migratory Egyptian vultures and they recently tagged e Egyptian vultures and, and they were still killed on the power line in that same area where they were killed already in the 70s. Um, yeah, and th th there's other developments that are threatening vultures, uh, such as geothermals of the Hell's Gate uh, National Park in, in, in Kenya, where there's breeding rupels vultures below there on those cliffs and a lot of developments that are a disturbance to breeding birds. So these are critically endangered rupels vultures and wind parks go up, of course, in the best area for wind, such as along the Rift Valley. But obviously those are also good areas for um, uh, vultures and they move over those areas from breeding sites to foraging uh, areas. They get hit when they fly into wind turbines. This is a good example. Uh, and people always wonder, well, well, why doesn't the bird fly away? Well, it doesn't see that turbine well. This is a, a griffin vulture getting hit by a turbine in Spain. And many birds die. There's, there's infrequent monitoring. Um, a lot of these birds remain undetected, especially in areas where, where there's not a lot of carcass monitoring. Um, vultures, when they, when they fly, when they forage, they look to the sides and they look down. So they don't see a turbine which is above and in front of them. It's just not within their field of vision. So that's, that's one of the reasons why they, uh, their avoidance behavior is not as, as well as some other birds. Um, so where do we start? We, we need to uh, look at these, these trends in populations and, and what we do is, is population surveys. Uh, and a lot of these surveys in Africa are counts from roads to determine the population trends and, and key areas, uh, including for vultures. So we drive roads, count, count birds along those roads and um, yeah, try to see basically what their, what their population trends um, are like. This also allows us to to map the distribution of different species. This is a map that shows some of the results of those counts. In orange are the recent counts, in blue are the historic counts based on the museum specimens. This is from the African Raptor database at Habitat Info. So yeah, this is, allows us to, to map the, the historic habitat, the historic distribution of vultures and their current distribution. And as elsewhere, um, this is true for many raptors, obviously the, the habitat has shrunk considerably. So on the left is an example for white-headed vulture, the rare vulture I spoke about in the beginning. It's, it's a bird that was historically widespread across Africa, but is now in pockets of, of suitable habitat. Um, and it's, it's decreasing still. Uh, the map on the right shows the, the overall value for, for seven vulture species. Um, so not only have these birds declined in numbers, their habitat um, has also shrunk considerably and more so for some than for other species. What we've seen with these distribution models and, and the species richness models where we, we model the distribution and overlay that of one vulture with the other is that some of the richest areas in East Africa uh, occur in southern Kenya and uh, across the border with Tanzania. So the Mara Serengeti stands out as a key area for vulture conservation and, and that's this area here. Um, and there's some other areas as well that are obviously key areas and those areas are the ones that we focus on. Um, but what we do in collaboration with the Kenya Bird of Prey Trust and the Mara Raptor Project in Southern Kenya is we survey the vultures also at their nests. So um, this is a photo by the Mara Raptor Project by the main power in Stratton Hatfield, who are at the moment surveying nest. This is a, a picture of last week where a, a leopard faced vulture chick is at a nest. This photo was taken by a camera on a pole where we just quickly check what the, what the situation, the status of the nest is, where there's eggs or a chick at the nest. 
and then so many nests are checked and this way we can also have data on uh, breeding output and how that varies between years and over time and this is a, a white backed vulture nest also in the Maasai Mara. So the current status of vultures um, is well, they're still fairly common in, in the Masai Mara. There are a few species that, that are, are still there in, in large uh, numbers and, and healthy populations, but there's big threats and poisoning is, is a big one, of course. Um, so we recorded previously with our program an annual mortality of up to 33% for some species um, and a strong decline of, of vultures. Uh, this is the mean abundance, which is indicated here on the y-axis, the numbers of birds per kilometers that were seen on these road counts. Um, and in light gray are the early counts and in dark gray are the more recent counts. So in the reserve, the Mara Reserve, as well as in the buffer area, especially in the grazed areas there, there's been a decline of vulture numbers uh, on those roads. And this basically just shows there's a shift also. Some species are more affected than others. Uh, on the left here in the dark are um, the later counts. On the right are the more uh, um, uh, historic counts. And what is obvious is that, uh, for example, Rupel's vulture uh, now is becoming relatively uh, more common as compared to tree beating white backed vultures. There may be a number of reasons for that. Um, tree breeding vultures may be more vulnerable in any case to disturbance than those that breed at cliffs such as Rupel's vulture. So we've tracked vultures ac across across Kenya and some obviously they, they don't remain in the country they move across vast areas they, they, they move across the border and here is again that Mara Serengeti area where birds that were tagged in the Maasai Mara also enter the Serengeti. Um, and this is data from the Peregrine Fund North Carolina Zoo and the University of Utah. Um, once we combine these tracks of, of all these different individuals, we get an idea where the important areas are and what the connectivity is like between national parks and, and also yeah, between different areas in uh, this region. Um, and again, I want to highlight this, this uh, uh, Mara Serengeti area where we're working in southern uh, Kenya is not only an important area for vultures, it's only an er also an area where the likelihood of poisoning is quite high. On the left is um, the modeled likelihood of poisoning based on actual carcass counts of vultures that have been poisoned. And on the right is one um, where this likelihood is presented as basically the, the risk, risk of, of um, ivory poisoning or uh, poisoning related to this um, uh, elephant poaching. And uh, basically the retaliatory killing, so the, the, the likelihood of conflict occurring as a result of the lion and uh, a hyena depredation of livestock. So apart from it being a very important area for vultures, the risks of poisoning in those areas are also quite high, which is why we're working there. Um, this map shows some of the tracks of the vultures in the Maasai Mara, which is, which is this area here. And it shows also where the birds have been found poisoned. This, this red dot means a bird has been poisoned. So here, for example, one bird was poisoned there around the Maasai Mara. Another vulture was poisoned there. And another one went to Southern Serengeti and was poisoned in Southern Serengeti, was poisoned there. So we do have birds that we tag in, in Kenya and that die in Tanzania. Yeah, so I said, this is a Rupel's vulture coming in. They come in from, from very, um, large areas, um, they move vast distances in, in, in search for carcasses. Um, and then they, they rid the carcass of its flesh quite rapidly. So they're obligate scavengers. Um, vultures clean a carcass of its meat quite fast. If they don't, then jackals or hyenas will visit those carcasses. And there's an increased risk of the spread of disease among such facultative uh, scavengers. Um, so um, when a carcass is not uh, detected by vultures, it lies around and then more jackals and hyenas visit and they carry diseases, canine, canine distemper is one. And so the, the risk of those diseases getting spread from those carcasses is greater. Um, yeah, yeah, some fights between vultures, it's, it's incredible to watch them when, they, when they're at a the carcass. Um, and in, the, in this Mara area, you can get 
hundreds of vultures at, at a single carcass, which is also obviously the reason why they're so vulnerable, because if one carcass is poisoned, then many birds die. What are we trying to do? We're working with uh, GPS um, tag developers. So the, these are uh, transmitters that we place as a backpack on the vultures. Um, what we're trying to do is to get to those sites where vultures are, are poisoned as fast as possible. And one of the ways to do this is GP, by GPS tagging vultures. And based on um, the accelerometer data, which is at the bottom of this uh, picture here, we can analyze the specific behavior of, of a bird um, by developing this algorithm, which is what we're doing now, that basically indicates the position of a bird's um, to, uh, in, in relationship to the ground. For example, when it's on the ground, this accelerometer data will be different than when it's circling. And um, now when it's been poisoned, its behavior will be uh, quite different from when it's just uh, sitting on the ground. Um, and we're able to, to detect such different behaviors. So when a bird is poisoned, we can, we can detect it. And then uh, what we're working on now is to have these GPS trackers send us real-time data every 30 seconds of birds. And so we can get a handle on when a bird gets poisoned, we immediately go to the spots where, where they've been poisoned. Um, so this is us with uh, one of these birds uh, late de uh, December. I'm working here with Shiv Kapila of the Kenya Bird of Prey Trust and we're having this tag on this uh, Rupel vulture to, to test it basically to build that algorithm and um, have the bird do um, different behaviors so that we can later on analyze what that looks like um, uh, in terms of the, the algorithm that we want to develop. Um, this is a LoRa antenna, so we need to set up an, a network of antenna to, to uh, receive that real-time data and get uh, and then expand this network so that over across larger areas, we can, we can look for uh, this data and, uh, and try to, to get through those poisoning incidents fast. In addition, we're also putting GPS tags on tawny eagles. They're often also one of the earlier arrivals at a carcass. Here's one fighting with, with leopard face vultures. And here's us uh, placing rings and, and tags on a tawny eagle in the Masai Mara. Um, there's a tawny with an Onitela tag. Um, and it's, it's uh, in, in the Mara, this is a female at a nest. Um, and what we've seen is that these tawny eagles are very territorial. Um, they have non-overlapping ranges here. They, these are, are four track birds. Uh, what we hope to accomplish is obviously learn more about tawny eagles, but as well as, as learn about their behavioral and their foraging ecology. This also allows us to, uh, to know when a tawny eagle has been poisoned. And so we also use this data to find poisoned carcasses in the landscape. In this case, using uh, tawnies, and with with these day uh, with these GPS trackers, we're getting really high resolution data. So this is just an example of one day where a tawny eagle has been soaring and gliding, and and all of this is is quite uh, visible. Um, this is data that's been collected every second we have a location, an X Y Z location. So we can look into real, uh, really high resolution, really high detail into these movements of these birds. This is another flight path where Tony is circling up and then gliding away. Okay, and then when we know of a location uh, of a poisonous carcass, uh, our, our team in Kenya goes in. This is um, Isaac, he's a uh, vulture liaison officer. We work with vulture liaison officers in, in around the Masamar and Amboseli ecosystem. And, and our team goes to these sites and, and tries to head out and, and find the, the, the poison vultures as soon as possible. This is Simon Thompson of the Kenya Bird of Prey Trust carrying off uh, that white-backed vulture. Simon is a, is a great raptor expert and one of the most knowledgeable people on, rapt on African raptors. He's, he's uh, a very important partner for us and, and we're teaming up with, with various organizations to try to tackle this problem. Um, and when we do find a case where vultures have been poisoned, we burn the carcasses as fast as possible and everything else to try to prevent more poisoning from happening. 
And this is our team, uh, Valerina Soita here, taking care of a lapid face vulture. Uh, we try to rehabilitate vultures at poisoning scenes that have not died and try to uh, get them in, take care of them, administer atropine so that we reverse the effect of the poison, such as in this case. We also do trainings on, on such uh, rapid responses. How, how do people need to respond to such a poisoning incident? So, so we teach um, rangers and, and, and others on the best way to re respond to such a poisoning incident. And yeah, this is Shiv and Simon again showing how to handle a vulture, how to get uh, uh, poisoned meat out of, the, uh, out of the bird basically by massaging the crop and, and how to hold it, et cetera. Our team has had this training. And that allows us to ship vultures quickly using helicopters or planes sometimes. Um, this white bag is shipped out of, of a poisoning incident location and then being uh, brought out into um, one of the sites where we uh, keep them. It's these holding facilities that we're building around the Mara. Uh, yeah, and try to get birds back in shape before we release them. This is Simon holding a white back here. And this bird was then released again, same as this, this leopard face vulture. That is, I mean, this bird is not looking good here, but he survived. And yeah, in the end, we, we release these birds and we release them with GPS trackers as well to see uh, what happens with them. So, so this is a map that shows some of the results of that uh, tracking that we've done with rehabilitated vultures. And it has shown that the whitebacks, uh, the leopard-faced and the rubel's vultures that have been released have done well for, for uh, uh, several months after their release. We were getting this sort of data and they were moving around in the Mara and the Serengeti area. Education is quite important, and, and this is part of our, our work as well. We, we try to stop people from poisoning wildlife. It's a bigger issue. Poisoning is cheaply available. It's widely available. People grab it quickly. Um, it's a method that's widely used to get rid of lions and hyenas. And obviously, there's an important reason to stop it, because it, it kills so much. Um, and vultures are the main victims. And it's, education starts early. This is Valerie teaching a, a school of children. And we're talking now online, obviously, with COVID to people in Tanzania as well, to set up um, collaborations across the border to chat about how to, how to really conserve vultures uh, that move across borders. And uh, various organizations are involved, including those that improve BOMAs, for example, to protect livestock. Um, and how is this then helping vulture conservation? Where well, we're looking at evidence now to show improved uh, vulture survival rates in Kenya. Um, obviously, we're, we're monitoring the populations, looking at stabilization or, or an increases locally in the population sizes, possibly. Um, so this is important. We need to quantify, basically, the impact of our work. And these are the most important uh, variables in that regard. These are the most important parameters to look at vulture survival rates and, and population uh, size, breeding numbers. Obviously, COVID has had an impact on our work. Uh, we've had reduced mobility, but potentially similar levels of conflict. We've had fewer poisonings detected. Our community engagement activities were reduced. Um, and COVID has obviously affected the livelihood of communities, uh, including such as livestock markets, businesses, and especially also tourism. Uh, it's been more difficult to arrange capture and tagging permits. Uh, because many offices were closed and students have not been able to travel to field sites. So COVID obviously has affected our work as much as uh, everyone else. And in Africa, what has been predicted is that the effect of COVID is probably much worse than, for example, in Europe, where I am now. And um, it's due to reduced income from, from tourism, due to re reduced possibilities to have anti-poaching operations. And obviously more poverty people get losing their jobs and therefore turning to, um, for example, wildlife poaching uh, more frequently now than before. Um, we've done um, a poster that shows the output, that shows the, the threats of, of the mapping that I illustrated previously. And, and those have been spread so that we know where the most involved, important vulture uh, populations are and we know where the threats 
uh, our focus. And let me know when you're interested in this. We, we can have them printed large and sent out. I want to thank, um, finally, partners and collaborators that are very important to us, obviously. And, and without these, um, we wouldn't be able to do our work. I want to particularly highlight the role of our partner, Guinea Bird of Prey Trust, which is very important, the Mara Raptor Project, um, and various others, obviously, that are uh, shown here. Well, thank you very much. I assume now, um, yes, I'm, I'm quite sure that if you have any questions, please ask, and uh, I'll yes. try to answer them. Yeah, thank you for such a wonderful and very informative presentation, Ralph. And without losing any time, we'll get on to the Q&A session then. Um, there is a question asking, is meat of vulture consumed in Africa? If so, then is it a common practice or is it only limited to some parts and people? It is consumed. Um, what we found in Nigeria when asking uh, people that sold vultures for meat and for fetish for, for belief-based use, is that approximately 25% of carcasses is actually sold for meat. It's those fresh carcasses and people will eat hooded vultures such as they will eat chicken actually. So yeah. Uh, what is the current situation with the Kofenak and other NSAIDs in East Africa? And what are the efforts to mitigate these problems? It might be used. It's not as big as a problem as it is in Asia. Um, and, and that's also because um, that meat will not stay around as, as it will in Asia, where, where basically cows are put out and those cows will, be, will have been treated by diclofenac. In, in East Africa, the likelihood of that happening is, is not very high. The likelihood of carcasses being put out and poisoned uh, intentionally is, is much higher. So it's incomparable to the situation in, in Asia in that regard. And we haven't seen that diclofenac is, is anywhere near as big a problem as, as the pesticide poisoning. Um, another question is, has there been any record of the eff effect of poisoning on the egg laying or clutch size with subsequent hatching of the chicks leading to its mortality? That's an interesting question, no no record because we, we, we haven't looked into that actually and uh, of course that, that there's a lot of research on organochlorides and how that has affected populations of peregrines and ospreys and etc in the past that DDT is still being used in in Africa widely we we haven't looked at that it's it's um, something that we might I would think of other species of raptors to look into to 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 look for that problem really rather than vultures Okay, and we have another question about, has there been any vulture safe zone implemented in Africa? The area and the collaboration that I just spoke about is actually our first try to implement a vulture, a vulture safe zone in, in, um, in East Africa. There's one in Southern Africa. It's the start of an implementation of that. A vulture safe zone in, in Asia will be one where the diclofenac is actually not being used. A vulture safe zone in Africa means anywhere in Africa, no poison, mm -hmm. no poisoning for trade, retaliatory poisoning, um, no electrocution or power lines, maybe, maybe no lead shot, et cetera. There's such a large um, palette of, of, of issues there. It's quite a challenge, but one that we're trying to implement in that Mara Serengeti area for one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then did you face any eth ethical issue in your study area, especially while handling the juveniles? Uh, you mean, you mean is, are the juvenile vultures mailed? Yeah, mainly the chicks, um, the pictures that you uh, showed earlier in your presentation, it was relating to that. I think it might be related to the tagging that we're doing as well. All yeah. that is according to um, international guidelines on, on the percentage weight that one can attach to a bird. There will always be a neg negative impact to anything that you place on a bird. We try to prevent that from happening as much as possible by, by using experts really to, to handle the birds and put the tags on. And by having um, uh, the tags drop off, we, we, we're uh, using actually a leather ring on the harness that actually weathers. And after a, a couple of years that, that drops the harness. So if the tag stop, stops working, that bird that may live on for another 10 years, will actually fly on without that, uh, that tag. So there's a, there's a weak link on that harness that we use. 
Okay, and we have a last question, which is why is a marginalized community who loses livestock to wildlife involved in conserving vulture? Is there any link between those community and the benefit of the vultures? The benefit to the community is really to, to um, prevent their loss of livestock. Our, our advantage is there if we, if we help people to pre protect, protect their livestock by um, improving the BOMAs or, for example, suggesting that they use guard dogs, etc. all of that. There's less of a reason to poison lions and hyenas in, retali in retaliation for that. So if there's fewer losses of livestock and people are helped at the same time, there's less poisoning and we're helped and vultures are helped. So that's the aim. Okay, we got one more question. Uh, could you please tell us what the most important thing that we uh, across the world could do to assist the plight of vultures? It, it's, it's really to spread the message, education and awareness is very important. Um, it's, uh, I find vultures fantastic birds, but they're, they're often neglected and it's more difficult. It's a more difficult species group to, to protect and, and to advocate for than our elephants, rhinos and lions, etc., or tigers in India. Um, it's a very important group of birds and to spread that knowledge to state that if we don't have these birds, if these birds are wiped out, we will have so many more carcasses that lie around rotting in our landscape that that will lead to not only perhaps an increase of feral dogs or more spread of disease, um, but all sorts of problems um, that we have no clue about. So they're a key group to, to protect and maybe that's the most important message of all. I think they're beautiful actually, especially in flight. Um, mm -hmm. So Maybe that's, that's the sole reason just to protect them for that. There's other reasons. Thank you. Yes, it is. They're really beautiful, but very easily misunderstood birds. And mm. it, it is quite disheartening how much endangered these majestic species are, especially because the causes are mostly anthropogenic. But hopefully conservation awareness of vultures spread out across globally and we get to improve their situation in the future. And with that positive note, that was the end of the Q&A session. Thank you, uh, all the audiences, for such interesting questions. And thank you, Ralph, for answering all the questions. Uh, we come to the end of the program. Would you like to give any final remarks before we move on to the closing session? Um, I thank you a lot, again, for the invitation. And I appreciate the audience listening. And um, yeah, today is International Vulture Awareness Day. Um, I hope you, you help spread the message. And thanks again for the invitation, Talsi and Adita. Thank you. Thank you to you again, Rolf. And thank you to all the audiences who, uh, joined, who's joined us in this 14th session of Nature Speak series. Those of you who joined us a bit late, I'd like to let you know that the entire session will be available on Himalayan Nature's YouTube channel and Facebook page. We will be back with another interesting series next week. So please do follow the Himalayan Nature's page to find out more about the upcoming series. And with that, on behalf of the team, I'd like to thank uh, Ralph again and all our audiences and wishing everybody a goodbye and namaste.